Hi, uh, this is the uh, third lecture in the module on strategies and materials uh, for surface repair. Uh, the, uh, in this, we will talk about uh, the compatibility of repair materials with substrate uh, and also we will uh, look at some of the stuff which we already discussed in the previous slide. Uh, so, this is the recap of volume change mechanisms. So, let us uh, I will show you four major uh, material parameters which really influences the volume change. One which we discussed was thermal coefficient of expansion. You can see if the uh, alpha is the if the coefficient of thermal expansion, this O here indicates old material or existing concrete or substrate and then N indicates the uh, uh, repair material. So, let us assume that uh, given a temperature change evenly distributed through the material, the following stresses will occur according to the relationship uh, of uh, the thermal coefficients of new and old material. So, as you see on the picture on the right side or above the picture, if alpha of the new material is equal to alpha of the old material, then there will be no shear stress uh, between the two between the uh, layers of uh, two materials. But if in this case, let us say alpha of the new material is less than that of the old material, then that means the, the new material will shrink less than the old material as it is shown in the uh, picture or uh, in other words, uh, uh, the because the volumetric change is different for these two, there will be a development of shear stress uh, along the uh, shear forces will be developed uh, and then you will have shear stress and then that might lead to uh, failure or delamination if the bond strength between them is not really uh, good, especially the shear bond mechanism. So, we will talk about this later also. And uh, if the uh, if the new material has higher coefficient of thermal expansion than the old material, then also this will happen. So, as long as there is a difference between the thermal coefficient of thermal expansion between the two materials, then there could be a generation of shear stress and then the shear bond is uh, will get stressed in that case. And the other parameter we looked at was modulus of elasticity and here E0 indicates mo modulus of the old material and En indicates modulus of the new material or the repair material. Now, let us say at a particular time instant after the repair or given uh, or during the repair, let us say all given an evenly distributed load the following stress will occur according to the relationship of modulus of elasticity of uh, the new and old material. So, here as you see if both the moduli are equal or almost equal then there is no generation of stress, uh, but if one of that is different let us say E n is greater than modulus of the old material then the one with the material with higher modulus will experience a higher stress at the same strain level or deformation level, then uh, that means that mod material with more uh, modulus will uh, probably lead to higher crack, uh, you know will tend to crack at an earlier time. So, as you can see here, this is that case when you have a high modulus, then that material will go into the plastic stage uh, when you talk about the stress strain behavior and then uh, it will experience higher stress and then go to uh, 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 then experience cracking where the material with low modulus is still experiencing a lower uh, stress level. Okay. Now, uh, shear bond is stressed in the can be stressed depending on whether this load is applied in the uh, which direction in the case as in the second drawing here you can experience uh, you can say that the shear bond between the two materials get stressed uh, you know and you might have a failure along that uh, plane. Now yeah this I already discussed brittle or high modulus material may become overstressed uh, at the same strain level and then get uh, then lead to cracking. Now if another one was uh, drying shrinkage. Again, 
uh, if you have one material if it is going to shrink more than the other or if you have one material expanding more than the others and then but when you talk about shrinkage it is uh, you know it is shrinking. But if you are talking about the swelling mechanism, why I am telling about swelling also is because it is also something to do with the moisture. So, either way if there is a volumetric change then the shear uh, bond here uh, gets stressed or the st shear stress will be generated. Now, load carried by repair might become less. So, yeah, the integrity of the uh, system will be lost and that is something which we do not want to happen. So, very important to make sure that there is no stress generated along the uh, shear bond along the bond. Now, also we talked about creep again if the assuming that the old material has already developed a stable creep volume that means no further creep and then the following stress will occur according to the amount of creep occurring in the uh, new material. So, if the there is no creep uh, then there is no stress generated, but in the case as you saw she is as you see here then uh, C n if it is greater than 0 or a significant number then you might see that there is a, a significant deformation and then uh, the uh, once there is a deformation or in other words there is a a movement then you can actually experience a shear stress along this plane which is uh, not that good. Yeah, now let us look at the uh, volume change effects effects on the uh, you know uh, how uh, the uh, stress development or a strength is uh, not the stress development how the strength is developed uh, inside the concrete or the material and at the same time how the uh, stress is generated because of various actions and then how uh, the combination how it leads to uh, cracking. So, look here this this curve here this one uh, this curve here okay, that is showing the capacity of the repair material or how the tensile strength of the repair material is increasing or is uh, you know evolving and then another curve which is this curve this curve here which is showing the elastic stress from the drying shrinkage. So, one is capacity the other one is demand or there is a stress generated because of the drying shrinkage and there is also a relaxation factor or you know because of the creep and restraints there will be a reduction in the uh, stress up, uh, you know applied stress and so the net tensile stress is actually this. So, this reduction is indicated by these vertical arrows in this sketch. So, basically when the crack develops or the crack is formed when the net tensile stress is actually uh, more than the tensile capacity of the repair material. So, the moment when there is more tensile stress than the stress which the material can take at that moment it uh, the uh, material starts to crack and the graph at the bottom it kind of shows the uh, drying shrinkage strain as a function of time. The one on the top shows the tensile stress uh, as a function of time and the one on the bottom shows the strain uh, as a function of uh, time. Okay. Now, this is the same thing what I just discussed uh, written in text. I will just go through it very briefly. So, most uh, drying shrinkage will take in the first uh, 30 days. Uh, you know maybe even few months I mean I would like to say not just 30 days, but in uh, at least uh, some at least some months, but it will continue to happen and then uh, repair materials with drying shrinkage will contract uh, if unrestrained, but without cracking. But if there is a restraint which is the case in most cases uh, they if they are that means if they are not free to shrink uh, because they are bonded to the substrate or restrained by the substrate then there will be tendency to uh, crack the material rather than just letting the material to shrink completely. Now, uh, in this when because of the restraint the, the stress will uh, you know accumulate and then that will lead to significant uh, strain and then repair material has no tensile strength when first placed basically in the fresh material. 
you know as time uh, passes that the material will uh, you know mature itself and then gain more and more strength which we already discussed in the previous slide and but as the material is stretched it also relaxes due to the creep factors that is the uh, vertical arrows in the graph uh, which is this one here the vertical arrows indicate that reduction uh, in the stress uh, due to the uh, creep effects and there is a fight between uh, this uh, tensile stress developed and the capacity which is also uh, developed. So, uh, whenever there is a crossing over point that is uh, you know at this point when there is more stress applied than the capacity of the material then the material will uh, lead to cracking. Okay, this is uh, you know some uh, photographs in from our lab where uh, you know it is showing how to test the shrinkage uh, you know behavior in a material in a concrete system. You can see it is a length comparator where you have a prism of concrete with plain concrete and with a uh, you know we, we can as as a period of time or uh, we can expose the concrete specimen to environmental conditions and then measure the change in the length of the specimen and the change in length will indicate uh, the you know uh, resistance against the material resistance of the material against uh, free shrinkage this there is no reinforcement in this concrete so it is essentially uh, looking at free shrinkage mechanisms and we assume that if the free shrinkage is very high then uh, then definitely you may have other problems even if you provide reinforcement in concrete you will see cracking because of significant potential for uh, shrinkage of the concrete. So, we have to make sure that the concrete or the repair material which is used is having sufficiently low uh, or sufficiently high resistance against shrinkage or sufficiently low shrinkage. So, what is that sufficiently low shrinkage? So, we will see some uh, example here. It is this numbers here need not be taken as a, you know uh, you know fixed numbers it is up to the engineer and for the specific case you have to decide what is good for a particular application and what is bad for a particular application those have to be designed. But this is just a guideline to tell you uh, what is uh, uh, what can be called as a low shrinkage, moderate shrinkage and high shrinkage. If the shrinkage is less than 0.05 percent then we can say it is low shrinkage. If it is between 0.05 to 0.1 then we can say it is moderate and if it is greater than 0.1 then we can say it is high shrinkage and maybe that kind of material should not be used. Now, another thing which I wanted to tell is the availability or you know how in market is taking care because many places the goal is to keep drying shrinkage to be almost 0. Okay, as written in the yellow box at the bottom left, uh, but uh, you know when I say 0, so anyway uh, it is very very low that is that is what is the uh, you know idea. So, two types of shrinkage uh, or you know two types of materials are available in the market. One is called non-shrink, one is called non-shrink uh, materials and the other is shrinkage compensating material. Okay. So, the non shrink is basically does not shrink. So, if you for example, if you add uh, shrinkage reducing admixture then uh, you know it acts at the microstructure level by reducing the surface tension of the uh, material of the uh, liquid phase and it does not allow the material to shrink. Okay. Whereas, in the case of shrinkage compensating materials or grouts or shrinkage compensating um, uh, mortar, uh, what, what is the uh, you know idea is it there will be some kind of expansive agent provided in the material. So, when you provide an expansive agent the, uh, the role of that is it allows shrinkage, but at the same time there is something else which is happening in parallel which compensates for the shrinkage which has happened. So, these are the two types of uh, you know materials if you want to categorize available. So, it is one is non shrink the other one is uh, shrinkage compensating. Now, uh, 
this this graph kind of shows again uh, you know what is this range you know as i listed on the left side uh, very low shrinkage low shrinkage and then moderate shrinkage and high shrinkage so you can just uh, see so as the shrinkage is more and more the tendency to sh to shrink the tendency to crack is also more as you go towards the right the tendency to crack is more so now how to obtain mixes with low shrinkage we can use uh, maximum possible aggregate maximum possible so that means an optimum aggregate content uh, you know is best and then of course use clean and sound aggregate clean means there should be no unwanted dirt or you know uh, unwanted material in the uh, aggregates and use aggregates with maximum size as practical uh, because you have to think about the uh, spacing between the reinforcement uh, you cannot keep on increasing the size of the aggregate so whatever is the practical uh, thing and then as per the codes uh, you have to see what is that maximum size allowable and use maximum of that so that the amount of uh, the idea is to use less amount of uh, you know fine powder or the cement so that the maximum space is occupied by the aggregates whether it is fine aggregate or coarse aggregate the space in the concrete maximum space should be occupied by the aggregate and provide only that much cement which is necessary to bind or glue all this aggregate and not to add any cement which is uh, you know as a filler okay sometimes to avoid uh, you know let us say there are you know even in uh, not necessarily in Indian practice but in other parts of the world people actually use finely ground uh, you know limestone or limestone powder as a filler material which essentially uh, will not uh, react much like the cement but it will occupy that very fine space which is uh, available between the aggregates uh, you know so that is also something which is important to know and avoid materials that increase water demand. So, if you put too much of fine materials then there will be an, an you know the water demand will be more. So, you will end up in using a higher water cement ratio which is also not good uh, when you talk about uh, resistance against uh, shrinkage. Now, finely ground cement is probably not a uh, good idea all the time and high temperature mixing is also not a good idea all the time. And now uh, cure uh, because high temperature mixing means the water loss will be there and then that means drying will happen even at the uh, early stages of concreting so which will lead to uh, cracking. Now uh, cure adequately very important to minimize especially plastic shrinkage or early shrinkage. Now it is uh, all these points we, you know they should be taken uh, with uh, uh, you know understanding the combined effects of all the above okay. So, it is not that just use maximum aggregates you know or use very limited cement but we have to really look at how the combination of these selections uh, will affect the shrinkage. So, that has to be studied and then a trial batching uh, sorry trial mixes must be tested uh, before going for large scale uh, repair works. Now, this is just an example showing uh, how shrinkage uh, after 3 months uh, of uh, exposure to about relatively dry environment with 50 percent relative humidity. So, as you see here you can see on this as you go down on this curve or in this table uh, you can see the aggregate cement ratio is decreasing that means as you go down on the table uh, the uh, lower the position the less the amount of aggregates and uh, lower the position uh, the uh, uh, more the amount of aggregate not the less. So, you can see here uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 so this number is increasing as you go down and then you have water cement ratio this 4 water cement ratios you can see 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 and 0 0.7. So, here again as you go to the right the water cement ratio is increasing. So, now what is the expectation when you have higher aggregates and lower water cement ratio then you will have uh, you know higher aggregate content and lower water cement ratio 
you will have a low shrinkage that is what is observed here. So, as you go to the in the table in this direction diagonally to the bottom left if you go you will see low shrinkage. If you go to the top right corners then you will see high shrinkage. Okay. So, that is a general idea of how the water cement ratio and aggregate cement ratios interact and uh, you know influence the shrinkage resistance. Now, let us also look at what are the different ingredients which you can see uh, in uh, you will observe in repair various repair materials available today. Definitely there are binders, it could be cementitious and uh, you know polymeric uh, binders also and depending on the uh, need and the performance requirements. And of course, you have fine aggregates and coarse aggregates and also some special fillers okay. and then polymer modifies, modifiers and then fiber reinforcement and then some miscellaneous chemical modifiers. So, we will go through each one of these in at least one slide uh, on each of these. So, let us talk about the binders definitely Portland cement is there and these kind of binders are rich uh, you know uh, widely used in general repair or patch repair work where you know uh, no special uh, uh, performance requirements are expected. However, if you are talking about special applications where some chemical resistance or very thin application that means where the high shrinkage resistance is expected uh, you know in such cases. Uh, you know you will, you will see that the repair material will have epoxy or acrylics or some other polymers are, are used as a uh, you know or they are integrally mixed or integral uh, part of the uh, material. It is not like a coating or something which you provide, but you are actually mixing these materials along with the uh, cement powder and sometimes the quantity will be significantly high in that case also. Now, fine aggregate there is a different type I mean just the photo shows what is the idea to reduce the amount of binder which is used and enhance mechanical and durability properties of course, and durability. We cannot skip durability in any cases it is very very important. Now, used without the addition of larger size aggregates in some cases uh, especially when you talk about uh, you know if you are talking about in a uh, high flow requirements and etcetera, then you will see that the larger sizes, sized aggregates are uh, sometimes avoided or only small in quantity and this kind of fine aggregates, um, fine means it is not just like a powder, but uh, you know uh, up to about 4.75 millimeter as size and sometimes we will also see coarse aggregates which are you know with a limiting range of about 8 mm we will still use. The idea is the smaller the aggregate size which is used uh, comparing fine and coarse, the flow properties uh, will be influenced by the proportion of these aggregates and then uh, especially for repair uh, materials where flow is very very important because you most often work with confined spaces or there are restrictions on space and the flow path etcetera. So, in such cases you need a material which flows very well and in such cases the smaller size aggregates are used and uh, yeah. So, that is about the aggregates of course, the shape and gradation of aggregate also will affect the uh, compaction and special aggregates can be used if you are talking about abrasion resistant that means harder aggregates and which will abrade uh, less. Now, this is about coarse aggregate I last slide I also told about sometimes we tend to avoid very large coarse aggregates a maximum size of up to about 6 to 8 mm uh, is uh, typically used for uh, you know micro concrete or uh, most of the screed uh, concretes because you do not want very large aggregates uh, which will affect the flow and then you know dip, can cause more difficulties in placing the concrete. Now, uh, idea is here is re again reduce the amount of binder which is used and enhance general mechanical and durability properties because the quality of the aggregate is also very very important and when you talk about durability it is the aggregate and the interface between the aggregate and the cement paste which plays a significant role which we call ITZ 
interfacial transition zone between the aggregate and the cement paste. So, the quality of aggregate is very important when you talk about durability. So, let me also write durability here, durability of repair material is also important in addition to the mechanical properties. Now, uh, again uh, the more the aggregate you have less the shrinkage and then special aggregates uh, you know if you are talking about abrasion resistance then uh, you have to use uh, special aggregates which will uh, have good resistance against abrasion. Now, special fillers then the main idea here is they fill the space left between the fine and coarse aggregates used to improve the internal cohesion and the examples are uh, you know very fine powder fly ash micro silica uh, or micro uh, you know uh, limestone powder and one thing to note here it is not that uh, even though they are special fillers they also might have a role uh, in pozzolanic action mostly the more important role and then they also function like a, a filler and then I, uh, they enhance the permeability and the uh, strength of the material. Now, polymer modifiers examples are latex, acrylic, polyvinyl acetate or PVA with widely known name and also epoxy emulsions and the these materials again enhances various properties uh, waterproofing if uh, for one example if I say and uh, latex is used to reduce permeability that means it per, per resists the entry of water uh, into the uh, concrete and then enhances the bond. Uh, one uh, thing which I would say here is you know we should not always go with uh, because the cost of these uh, modifiers uh, you know depend it varies significantly. Uh, for example, uh, one uh, you know acrylic might be for example, very expensive sometimes um, you know uh, and latex might be relatively cheaper, but again uh, we should not go and select a materials because sometimes we have a tendency you know if, if a particular material cost more then probably that is better that is the intuition sometimes which we have. It is not always true, uh, so you have to really look at the uh, bond mechanisms and how uh, instead of looking at the cost of the material look at how the performance especially in long term. If you are talking about using of this repair materials for an exterior element you have to really look at how they perform under sunlight or UV exposure in long term ok. We are long term what I mean is at least uh, multiple 2 to 3 years you should wait uh, you know you, you will say so, but what do you do you cannot really wait for long term. So, there are tests available where accelerated tests where we can prepare the specimens and then put it inside a chamber and uh, which can be uh, like you know UV chamber, UV chamber and then, then test how, uh, how fast the materials degrade or how resistant they are. Uh, against the uh, UV radiation, so especially when you talk about polymer, polymeric materials we must uh, do or check the effect polymeric materials which are also exposed to sunlight we must check how the UV resistance of those materials are ok. And if they start degrading you might lose the bond and at the same time you might also lose the uh, mechanical properties like modulus and strength etcetera. So, that is something very important to uh, check. So, uh, before going to the next the point here is higher the cost does not mean that the performance is also going to be better you might find a better performing material at a uh, lower cost ok. Now, fibers also play a significant role uh, in uh, reducing plastic shrinkage especially and also they help in increasing the tensile strength and toughness of the uh, repair material essentially they help in controlling the uh, crack ok. So, you can see here steel fibers I mean this sorry there is some mistake here. Uh, essentially uh, there is a uh, impact of the fibers on uh, both uh, plastic shrinkage and it can also uh, you know positively affect the uh, or enhance the tensile strength and 
toughness uh, of the uh, concrete system. Now, miscellaneous or chemical modifiers, this modifiers behave various dif uh, you know depending on the case what you are talking about. So, for example, you have accelerators, retarders, shrinkage compensator, uh, compensating admixtures, water reducers, uh, you know flow enhancing agents, expansing, expansive agents and air and training admixtures. So, all these different type of materials are available uh, and they change various properties as uh, desired. So, you have to see if it is not that in all the repair materials you should have all these materials, but depending on the necessity uh, you have to choose uh, you know. So, that is where uh, the point is we need to know exactly what we want uh, when you talk about a repair material. Otherwise, the cases many cases are there where uh, you know unwanted chemicals are also added and then just is just increases the cost of the repair. So, the engineers must be like I said in the last class engineers must be able to dictate what is uh, required or what properties are required for uh, the materials which they use not uh, the, uh, the people who sell uh, these products are not the one who should dictate on what to do engineers should be able to tell and they provide when we say what is required they will tailor make the product and provide it uh, you know. Now, bonding of repair materials to existing concrete what are the uh, uh, you know important uh, you know uh, things to consider when we talk about bonding. So, I am going to call this the bond is between the repair material and the substrate. So, we are going to call it RS bond okay, because there is also another bond which is steel concrete bond. So, let I do not want to confuse between the two. So, in this lecture when we talk about bond it is uh, the bond between repair and substrate concrete. Now, the clean and sound substrate the surface preparation means the play, you know where you are going to place the repair material that surface should be very clean uh, that means no free or loose particles should be there. I put this picture here just to show you that you know this is not something which is a good practice. You can see that there is a lot of dirt and you know loose materials present in this uh, you know uh, the, the surface is not well prepared you know. So, that is something which is not good and also here it you can see it is very dry substrate. So, what will happen is the material the moisture which is available in the repair material will be absorbed by the substrate as soon as it comes in contact which is not a good idea rather what we should do is we should make the uh, substrate surface in saturated surface dry condition or SSD condition. So, you not too much of water, but at the same time not too less water. So, that there will be no absorption of moisture from the repair material to the um, substrate that is something which we should not avoid uh, we should not allow. So, should not absorb water from the repair material. Okay. Now, open pore structure in the is substrate is available because if it is available then it provides better interlocking. I am saying open pore structure, okay. it is not the pore structure inside the substrate, but at the surface of the substrate you need to have uneven surface. So, that there will be good interlocking or roughened profile uh, for mechanical interlocking and also the sufficient flowability the paste should have sufficient uh, the, the repair material should have sufficient paste which can flow and facilitate absorption into the pores the open pores in the substrate. And also when you apply the material we should provide sufficient pressure so that it helps in making good contact at the uh, bond surface. So, all these small pores available either the material flows and reaches there or if it is relatively dry repair material then you should uh, pack it very well or compact it very well. So, that the mechanical interlock uh, between the uh, substrate and the repair material is very uh, good. I will show this is the detail uh, an image showing what I just uh, discussed. You can see here this this uh, this is the uh, image first image to look at, and which is generally that uh, bond region. And you see two uh, you know red boxes there. So that's uh, my you know larger zoomed image of this first red box is this, 
uh, which is basically talking about the tensile bond mechanism. You can see here there are some regions where basically it ensures a mechanical interlock in the uh, you know perpendicular direction to the bond line or we are talking about tensile forces here and the tension bond mechanisms okay tension bond mechanism you can see here there is nice interlock happening here like bulb like uh, repair material the repair material flows into the open pore so the open pore which we discussed uh, in the previous slide is is this this is an open pore here and so the repair material goes in and fills inside and then it then hardens and then uh, you know it's very difficult to pull it out of that so definitely there is a good resistance against the tensile forces and similarly when you talk about the shear bond which is this uh, this sketch here uh, the you can see that bond line this is the bond line it's crossed by the aggregates so if you have sufficient amount of aggregate of reasonable large reasonably large size then you will get very good uh, resistance because aggregates uh, will provide a good resistance uh, against shear or they have good uh, shear resistance. So, that uh, the when aggregates come on that path the red line which I have drawn then they provide very good mechanical interlocking and it helps in uh, providing much better uh, shear resistance. Now, uh, uh, as we discussed there are these are the three widely used uh, repair uh, bonding agents available when when you apply this bonding agent they also helps in chemical bonding uh, that is also something important it is not always only mechanical interlock but chemical uh, bond uh, you know if the good adhesives are there that is essentially the bonding agent that will also help in enhancing the uh, bond behavior. There are a lot of materials available uh, for uh, performing repair work and then uh, one main uh, you know uh, requirement is that there should be very good uh, resistance against the uh, uh, you know against the bond failure or the bond strength of the uh, repair material uh, the bond strength of the interface between the repair material and the substrate should be very high and how can we check them these are four typical tests available slant shear test, direct shear test, uniaxial tensile test or pull off test and the uh, split tensile test. These are just schematic, I am going to show you this schematic again and we are going to discuss more detail on each of these uh, tests. Slant shear test, it gives relatively conservative, I mean uh, uh, most of the time a conservative result and how uh, where it can be done, it can be done on specimens prepared in lab and also those coarse, core specimens which are collected uh, you know uh, from the field and then what we can do is uh, you take the substrate and then cut the core and then you put uh, replace the top part with the uh, repair material and uh, you, you actually roughen this surface here uh, you know how do we roughen that surface there are way may, best thing is by uh, sandblasting or in other words uh, just uh, you know using some uh, grits you can uh, spray the grit onto the surface and then uh, roughen the surface and some times we, all have, we have also seen people actually chiseling the surface but that may not be a good idea all the time because when you chisel even though you see and uh, this is my opinion I have observed also this thing in some of the specimens where when you chisel uh, you think you are actually roughening the surface in a macro level maybe it is true you will have uneven surface depending on the size of the chisel but uh, when you really look closer in a millimeter scale then you can say or even smaller scale maybe the powder which is uh, you know coming at the time of chiseling will get uh, you know the powder will fill the open pores available on the surface which is probably not something uh, good, but at the same time when I say this if the real practice at site is also uh, by chiseling then uh, you do the, or the follow the same practice for making the test specimen that is very important you know you do not want to recommend chiseling in the field and then do a much better uh, 
you know practice in the lab to test so that that surface pre, you know preparation or the preparation of the substrate substrate is this and this is the repair material here so the the surface preparation uh, you know uh, like the preparation of the specimen is very very important. In this particular case the entire test results depend on how rough the uh, interface is. So, if you want to really see what is actually happening at the site prepare the surface of the substrate concrete in the same way as you will uh, practice in the field and then you can say in such case how the system uh, behaves and uh, these are the reference uh, test methods available. So, let me just uh, say this once more you can take a core from the field and then cut uh, you know a, a diagonal along that uh, core specimen or a cylinder specimen and replace one half uh, you know one uh, the top triangle in this uh, slide uh, in this uh, you know sketch replace that with the repair material. You can use the same uh, you know uh, cylindrical mold to cast the specimen and uh, do this test. Uh, and then uh, another way is uh, on site if you want to uh, uh, test something without really taking a specimen to the lab and all that this is a, ni a nice equipment available. So, uniaxial tensile test or pull off test uh, can be conducted on field specimens and directly on the field itself where you can actually connect this you can see the in the instrument here you can connect this uh, you know the bottom portion that holder on to the uh, you know uh, uh, the concrete surface or the surface of the repair material and uh, this essentially you are doing a tensile test like this. So, you take a core and then connect this uh, uh, the holder on to here the here you will hold you can see here like that and then you pull the uh, you know uh, these the cylinder uh, prepared and if the cylinder is face failing here the at the bond line then you can say the bond strength uh, you know it is not a good I mean you can actually assess uh, what is the bond strength and if it is uh, failing here then you can say the bond and the material repair material is very good actually the substrate is weaker and if the, it is failing here then you can say that the uh, bond material itself has a lower uh, tensile strength than the uh, bo uh, you know RS bond uh, bond line and also the substrate. So, you can make a lot of meanings out of this uh, test and the because it is done actually on the site it really tells you what is actually affecting uh, or what is the real behavior of the uh, st uh, system of this uh, field structure. Now, direct shear test where you prepare a specimen and then you see as you shown in the sketch here the yellow sorry the red arrows on the left side is the uh, you know is holding the substrate in place and typically there will be a plate here uh, and then you apply a load on to the repair material and you uh, enforce the material to experience direct shear failure along this plane here. Okay, so, this is a very good test again um, uh, to uh, do in the uh, typically in the laboratory and also on the field specimens, but uh, you know you have to see uh, for the case by case which is uh, good and the affected by the compressive strength of both the materials because depending on the size there could be some other actions also coming like this there will be compression happening here. So, those factors are also there that is it is not widely used uh, test method uh, because of these other uh, mechanisms which will affect the uh, test result. It is not very easy uh, to do this uh, test okay. and it measures the shear bond these are the reference documents. And also there is a split tensile test this is a picture photograph showing one half of the cylinder is a repair material and the other half is the concrete uh, substrate and just like uh, the typical split tensile test there is no difference between the test you provide uh, uh, you know do this exactly the you take a cylinder which has both concrete substrate and the repair material make sure that the surface or the interface between the uh, repair material and the concrete surface 
is perpendicular or it is the this is just like this it is in the same plane as the load is applied. Otherwise, if it is uh, if the cylinder is slightly rotated uh, then you may not be actually doing a right test. So, that is something uh, important precaution to be taken while doing this test. Now, to summarize in uh, this lecture we looked at the various volume change mechanisms. Uh, we talked about summarized you know how the th coefficient of thermal expansion, modulus of elasticity, drying shrinkage and creep uh, coefficient etcetera can really influence uh, the uh, behavior of the structure and how uh, and, uh, why it is important to keep this uh, also at a minimum uh, level. Uh, especially the coefficient of thermal expansion, drying shrinkage and creep and the modulus of all these should be comparable with that of the uh, substrate or the existing concrete element. You, if you have a difference between the uh, these properties, if here there are difference between the substrate and the repair material then that will induce a lot of issues or changes in the volume, changes in the volume of the repair and concrete substrate uh, you know and that will induce shear stresses at the interface which may have additional problems. We also looked at what are the ingredients, typical ingredients for repair materials and how uh, these ingredients uh, you know affect various properties and what are the uh, quality you know, you know and how do we select uh, these ingredients, what are the key properties uh, you know how they affect the. Uh, material behavior also. And then finally, we looked at the bond strength and how they can be tested bond strength between the substrate and the repair. We talked about RS bond repair material and substrate not the steel concrete bond in this lecture that is not the point. So, how the uh, how it can be tested both in the field and at the uh, in the laboratory and which can help uh, in uh, uh, ensuring good performance and over the uh, long period and uh, make sure that when you prepare bond uh, strength test specimens you follow what is actually happening at site and similar practices and then uh, then do the test uh, for this lecture and thank you that ends this module.